Chapter 26 Torpedoed April 6, 1942 At about 2.20 a.m. in the darkest part of the night, with clouds covering the stars, the port lookout on the bridge of the long-range Nazi U-boat said, Ziel von! Target ahead, and read off the degrees. He'd seen diesel sparks in the blackness. Instantly, Four high-powered binoculars were focused on the dim outline of a ship. She's not too big, said the watch officer, ordering speed decreased. Then he summoned the commanding officer from his bunk below. In a few minutes, the young captain lieutenant came up through the counting tower in his shorts and took a look, agreeing that the target was not as large as he would have liked, but his patrol had already been very successful. He'd killed 10 Allied ships, the last one a big tanker seven hours ago. Low on fuel and food, he was headed home to the U-boat base in Nazi-occupied Laurent, France, and had two greased torpedoes left in the bow tubes. Scanning the outlines of the ship, he decided to save one for the future and use one for this unexpected target. He sent the boat to battle condition. Ringing bells rudely awakened those who were asleep below. Half-naked men ran to their stations throughout the slim hull. The first officer always fired the torpedoes when the U-boat was surfaced, as it was now, and he was on the bridge within three minutes, yawning and rubbing his eyes. The captain lieutenant said, We take what we can get, almost apologizing for the size of the target. Just Use one. We can come in closer. The night would hide the submarine. Many of the Allied ships were still unarmed. The U-boat began to maneuver to get into proper firing position. At two o'clock, Timothy had been relieved of bridge duties to go astern and spend the rest of the watch on the Hato's fantail on lookout. He'd steered for an hour, then stood bridge lookout for another hour. He went by the galley to fix a cup of hot coffee and take it out on the stern. Because of wartime conditions and the U-boat menace, the captain had ordered nighttime lookouts fore and aft. Timothy didn't mind the graveyard watch from 12 to 4 because he didn't sleep all that much anyway. Old age again. He spent the time slowly pacing, watching the stars when the sky was clear watching the flying fish spring out of the sea and glide away from the ship's passage. The little ship was blacked out and everyone aboard was asleep, except those on watch. Timothy hadn't counted the passengers, but thought there were seven or eight aboard. The Hato would discharge most of them in Panama. He'd heard several would go on to Miami, the ship's next port of call. Timothy was glad to be back at sea even if it wasn't on a sailing ship. The diesel engines in this one pounded, and the exhaust swooping down from her stack stank. But he felt the sea under his feet, and by moving forward a few feet, he could avoid the exhaust smell. It was good to be a sailor again. Though it had been 14 years since the heady red rolled over and came apart in the wild seas between Antigua and Nevis, Seldom a week had gone by that he hadn't thought of Jennifer Rankin and the other passengers who drowned out there. There'd been a British board of inquiry at Antigua, the members concluding that Captain Timothy Gums had not been advised that a hurricane was approaching. No warning had been issued by the port authorities. Therefore, he was not responsible for the sinking of the heady red. The hurricane was a weather condition over which Captain Gums had no control. But Timothy clearly knew he shouldn't have sailed that day. The glassy look of the sea, the heat, the smell of the air, the gathering clouds, all told him he shouldn't sail. He gambled and lost. On nights such as this one, he thought of beautiful Jennifer Rankin, greed for those who had died, and asked to be forgiven. The U-boat's first officer shouted, that the forward starboard torpedo tube was ready. Bow cap off. It was wet, 
and the torpedo needed only the impulse from the bridge to be unleashed. Bridge control, said the first. The attack site, the target bearing transmitter was on. The Hato and the sights of the crosshairs aimed just aft of the midship house. Lined up, said the first. The captain lieutenant nodded. Everything was going well. He knew that within a few seconds the attack table would be connected with the gyroscope and the attack site. After that was almost automatic. So long as the crosshairs of the attack site held the target, the apparatus would do its job. The torpedo was set at a running depth of 12 feet to tear out the target's bottom, speed of 30 knots. Stand by for surface fire. Fire at 500 meters. The order was acknowledged from below. Tube one ready, the captain lieutenant said. Fire when ready, the first officer intoned. Ready, on, 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 finally he said. Fire! The firing button was pushed. The torpedo motor started, and two seconds later, the eel was on its way toward the Hato. The captain lieutenant looked at his stopwatch and counted aloud. An orange ball lit the dark sea, followed by a boom. Perfect, he said. Timothy was thrown to the deck by the explosion that drove the Hato sideways, and even before he could stagger up, the oil drums on the after deck were exploding, lighting the night with fire. A wall of it raged between where he was and the bridge. He heard yells and screams and the agony of shearing steel. He hesitated a moment, trying to think how he could get around the wall of fire and help those people midship. He knew they'd try to launch a lifeboat, but the flames grew hotter and higher. Abandoned ship was all he could do. The starboard stern life raft, sitting on a wooden incline, posed to drop into the sea, had already been launched by the impact of the torpedo. In the red light that surrounded the ship, he saw it about 50 feet off the stern, and he climbed up on the after rail, diving down surfacing, he swam toward the raft.